uh, as we go along, quite happy to take questions. Um, I was a student at Harvard back in the uh, early 90s, uh, before you guys mainly were born, and studied a, a part of my DBA and then transferred up to uh, Toronto because my girlfriend, now my wife, was in Toronto. So I returned back to Toronto, but had a great time being at Harvard and teach there from time to time. So it's one of the great universities of the world, without a, a doubt, um, rivaled by Oxford and Cambridge, where I've taught as well, and Stanford these days as a relatively newcomer. But it is really one of the great universities of the world and very much recognized as that. So I'm going to uh, share a few screen uh, slides as we go along here. And my latest book is one. Can you see my slides there? All right, Edward. So yes, you can. Perfect. Thanks. So this is uh, my notebook, which is this my publisher. It'll be out in about a month. It's called OK Boomer. And there was a mem going around a year or two ago, but OK Boomer, uh, working better with millennials and Generation Z. So that's uh, uh, a bunch of uh, students I travel with. I have something called the Hot Cities of the World Tour, and we go somewhere in the world. The last trip was Tokyo, Bangkok, and Hong Kong uh, just before the pandemic. We've been to the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Russia, before Putin, um, South Africa, Chile, and Colombia, and so on. So it's a chance to spend a lot of time with young people and learn from them and be taught by them. So that's what I'll be talking about from the book is a fair bit of what we're going to talk about. And I'll, I'll connect this back into financial issues, but it's not, it's going to come up from time to time. So the first idea is the theory of the decades. And I got started by interview. I do a CEO class where we have 26 CEOs come for an hour and a half each in the fall for the MBA. And I co-taught it with a guy named Paul Tellier, who was the head of the Canadian government, what's called the clerk of the Privy Council, then ran CN, the largest train company, about 25,000 people in Canada and the US, and then uh, ran Bombardier, which is about 65,000 people, Canada's most global firm. And we got talking about kind of one day I said to them in class, what should we do in our 20s? Because the MBAs were in their late 20s. And then asked them about the 30s. And so we went on and kind of the, what the decades. And so when you think about the theory of the decades, and again, we wave our hands because it might be you finish the 20s in one way in 29 or 31 and so on. And it depends on your life, how it goes. But the 20s is getting your base education. And I'll talk about that and a few ideas of that in a moment. Um, the 30s is matching and hatching, fairly typically. Not everyone does this, but you tend to get married and have a family in those, those times. The 40s is stretching into your prime, where you really become great at what you do, you're excellent, your career is taking off, you're becoming a, a senior vice president, things like that. And then the 50s, you're heading the ball out of the park. So it's something when you think about it, there was a famous American baseball player, Babe Ruth, and the word was at the end of his career he was so good, he could just point to where the ball would go and he would hit the ball there. And it was totally intimidating to any of the, of the pitchers because he was Babe Ruth. So in your 50s, you're heading the ball out of the park. And then in your 60s, you're giving back is essentially what you're doing at that point. And I just want to show you a, a great book from a professor at Harvard that I bought in reading. And it's something I'd be a great gift for your parents. So Arthur um, Brooks is a prof over at the business school. It's called From Strengths to Strength. You see the cover there. And what he's arguing is that in your early years, 20s, 30s, and 40s, you have crystallized, you have a rather fluid intelligence, that you quick mind and you tend to get the ideas to get your Nobel Prize then. Later in your 50s and 60s, you have crystallized intelligence, where in the 60s, it's kind of giving back. So some of your parents would be 50s and 60s. Great book, strongly recommend it to you um, going forward. It's something, a great gift for them, you know, for Easter, the summer holidays, or whatever you do when you give gifts. Now, getting back to the 20s, because is that where you guys are? Um, what my students tell me, and I have coffee with all my students, and I've uh, got a list of 5,000 McGill students I've taught since 2003. I started 2000, but the system didn't uh, have the names before that. And I'm going to send out to email to 5,000 of my fellow students um, asking to come on our hot cities trip next year to Iceland and Greenland. I like to bring along some alumni and just mention my book is out and put this code and you'll get it uh, at my price. So I'm not making any money from it. What my students tell me is the masters is the new bachelors. So simply the idea is that you have, um, you guys have bachelors or will shortly all being well, 
from the one of the, if not the premier university in the world. Uh, Oxford would be a rival, maybe Cambridge, maybe Stanford, MIT, but Harvard and Oxford are the great names in the world. But the master's is the new bachelor's is the expression. We have a university club near here started 140 years ago where to be a member, you had to have a degree. But back then it meant you were in the top 1% of Canadian society to have a degree at all. So it's something where now at McGill, we have three what they call pre-experienced masters. So we have a master's in data analytics, which our son Eric is doing. We have a master's in finance and a master's in retail, as well as an MBA, which tends to be for older people, late 20s is more like them. So it's something for you to think about is that maybe you should get a master's fairly rapidly and get it out of the way. Now, you can spend money to invest in yourself, but it's also you go back to your parents who've supported you probably throughout your life, you in elementary, high school, now university, and McGill, uh, I, Oxford, um, Harvard is very generous and helps families out a lot. But if you go to your parents now and say, I want to do a master's and I'll continue to live in relative poverty, will you help me? They're much more apt to, but if you do an MBA when you're 29, 30, and you go to your parents and say, will you help me? One is your parents are 10 years older, closer to retirement. And so when you're 30, your parents will be thinking about retirement. Plus you've made money for the last 10 years. So they go, honey, you pay the money, you've made it. So financially, it's a good idea to think about a master's now because your parents are more apt to help pay for it. And let me assure you at McGill, at Oxford, at Cambridge, we were delighted when a Harvard alumni shows up applying to our masters. One is there's huge snob appeal to say that Harvard alumni do our degree. They love you guys. Now you have to have a GPA and so on, but uh, as recall, Harvard GPAs are uh, reasonably generous if you do your job well. So it's something where I would look at doing a master's fairly soon because of your parents are gonna support you, but it checks a box, as well, a box as well. Now, when you get a degree, you get three things. First is you get a brand. Now you have absolutely the best brand other than Oxford in the world, okay? So that's great. You also get the second most, and, but you get the brand by the minute you're a Harvard student, then when you graduate, you own that and it will be in your obituary. Not to rough you, run you through life too quickly, but it's one of those things where Bill Clinton, president twice, might like him or not, but he was president twice in his obituary. They'll mention he was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford because that's one of the coolest things you can do. And they will mention you went to Harvard. So you've already got a great brand. The second thing you get is network. And I would really encourage you to think about your network. This, the best network is the students you actually know. And your Harvard undergrad network will be incredibly useful in 10, 20, 30 years from now because that woman from China, the girl now you know her as a girl, she, in 30 years, she'll be running a big part of China. That person from West Africa will, may well be a prime minister or in a cabinet minister. One of our alumni who got to know a bit is a cabinet minister in Guinea, West Africa, because the quality of Harvard people, if they go back home and they move somewhere else, they're apt to end up in very senior posts. So it's a great network you have. Now, the best is people you've actually done group projects with, you've gone drinking with, and stuff like that, where you know them as friends, and think that those friends are useful. But beyond that, there's the learning. So as a professor, you learn something, but what we teach you today in economics, in 10 years, they will have changed their mind a bit. Not because they're lying today, but as the field went on. So mm -hmm. I think the brand is the most important thing, and then the network. So really think about your network. And I'm amazed how incredibly helpful alumni are to my students and to myself as well. So when I go here, I'm just gonna show you, um, oh, sorry. I'm gonna show you uh, my screen again and go to LinkedIn. Now this is LinkedIn premium, which you pay a bit more a month, but it's incredible. Um, the incredible alumni, like, so when I look here at McGill, well, I'll get to Harvard in a minute, we have 210,000 alumni on LinkedIn and when I look at it, they're all over the world, but part of it is that what I have is I have 10,162 first level connections from McGill. Now I go out of my way and students uh, often, I may be the first person to connect with on LinkedIn, 
but enormously valued. Now, you look at Harvard, it has 460,000 alumni. And they live, you can see San Francisco, but the UK has almost 15,000 Harvard alumni on LinkedIn. So there's a lot more than that. India, 13,000. Brazil, 12,000. Canada, 12,000. Uh, DC, uh, Spain, 5,000. Germany, Sao Paulo, UAE, there's an incredible number of, a McGill alum, of a, a Harvard alumni. And they work at really interesting places. Uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, McKinsey, IBM, e &Y, um, Amazon, Meta, the World Economic Forum, that's Davos. Incredible network that you have available to you as Harvard students and alumni someday. What I find is that, and this is one of the principles of life I think is simply true, older people love to advise, give advice to young people. Almost all those Harvard alumni would be happy to give Edward advice because he's a nice young man at Harvard, so we know he's bright, we know he's clever. Um, he'll be, he's Harvard trained, so he'll be pleasant when he talks to us. And it's amazing how helpful people will be to you and they can become champions. So if you go start at McKinsey, I would look at Harvard alumni who are at McKinsey. Now, if you're in the Boston office or New York or LA or Toronto, or wherever you might be, connect with those Harvard alumni before you even start. In fact, if you're looking for a job at McKinsey, I would connect with some Harvard alumni at McKinsey and say, look at, I'm interviewing. Can we have 15 minutes on Zoom to get your advice about how to a better job, how to get a job at McKinsey? I find alumni are incredibly helpful to my students and new alumni. So when you move to, and Harvard, um, I was the chair of the Harvard Business School Club in um, Toronto some years ago, looked after the program committee. So we actually had Michael Porter show up from Harvard, the famous uh, business school prof. And I met him out at the airport. He had a private jet from alumni, bring him in. I drew him downtown, did the event and went back. And incredibly, hundreds of people in Toronto are, are part of the Harvard Business School Club of Toronto. We have a Harvard, Yale, Princeton club up here in, in, Toronto, in uh, Montreal. Uh, fewer alumni, obviously, than Toronto or Boston, but incredible network that you really should get into. Part of that, what I think you should be is a reverse mentor. So one of the chapters in my book on OK Boomers working with uh, Zs is on reverse mentoring. And when I was young, it's kind of like, you know, they were here, I was there. Really fewer older people asked my advice. Well, what I would argue today, when I talk to older people, is that I am less wise than someone my age 20 years ago, because my wisdom is aging faster than the generation before me, the seniors' wisdom. The world's changing so much. If you were a CEO before COVID and you retired, we don't listen to you as much as someone who actually lived through COVID because they just have a very different life experience. So something where being a reverse mentor. So I, have, I tell older people that 25% of the time, Zs like yourself should be mentoring older people. So one is that you're mentored by them 75% of the time, but part of it is that you should get a relationship when you work with a senior person where you reverse mentor them. Now you kind of bring the idea slowly to them and just say, look at, let's talk about technology. Let's talk about generation Z values. Let's talk about the things that resonate with you. So that's the 20s. Let's get back to the 30s now for a little bit. One of the things that's really important, and we hear this a lot, is the idea of purpose. So one of the things that you want to do in companies is have purpose and meaning. So I was uh, talking to Bloomberg this morning about um, should Nestle over in uh, Switzerland um, invest in Russia? and we discuss that kind of investment issue in Russia and what should companies do, one of the things that companies are increasingly wanting to have, and your generation is pushing them especially, is purpose. So one of the things to do, particularly in your 30s, but your 20s, is to find your purpose. Now, here's kind of a diagram from a friend of mine who wrote a book called The Purpose Effect, Don, Dan Pontefract from uh, out in BC. And what we want to do is find an organizational purpose 
an, an organization with a purpose that resonates with us. So you want to have some purpose that we're not here just making money. We're doing something good and useful in the world. We're probably impacting climate change. We're helping. We're doing EDI things, equity, diversity, and inclusion things. We're helping uh, blacks because of Black Lives Matters. We're helping women. Uh, we're helping everyone, but we're, what we're doing is we're doing good things in the world. So you want to have an organization that resonates with, with you and your values. Your role, the part of thing that you do in an organization, should have a sense of purpose, but it's the per, uh, personal purpose is the thing that you want to think about in your 20s into your 30s. So part of what you want to think about is what is your purpose? What is the thing that really makes you want to get up in the morning and go to work. So making money is good, and this is a bit about finance, but what you want to do is find that purpose. And companies are looking for what their purposes are. Also, one thing that's very interesting is that into the you know late 20s, early 30s, you might get a deduction. One of the things we did on our mortgage is uh, we had an extra deduction every year. So we had an extra month every year of payments and so what happened is that instead of taking 15, 20 years, it took like 12 years for the mortgage to be paid off. And it's something where if you just have an automatic deduction, you don't think about it. It just happens uh, and just continues month after month, year after year. You find you ended your mortgage. Now, I realize in the U.S. mortgage is tax deductible, but in Canada it's not. So once your mortgage is gone, what a huge relief that is. So... I, another thing I did is I automatically pay payments against my credit card so that every month my credit card is always paid off and never pay because it's outrageous amounts of interest. So a couple of things, automatic deductions for an extra payment for your mortgage and always pay off your credit cards. Now you need credit cards sometimes and you can get points on your credit card for free trips and stuff like that as long as you have the discipline to pay it off which is really important and very helpful to do. Now, something I did last uh, year before last was looking at uh, McKinsey. So McK I did some work with McKinsey where we looked at parental leave, that is fathers taking more than two months off for paternity leave. And I interviewed 70 men and 70 women. So at the end of the first interview, I thought I would just interview men because it was about father taking paternity leaves. And I asked the guy, the last question was, how much of the domestic housework do you do? And he said something. I heard a woman laugh, and it was wife, his wife. She came, put her arm around him, and whispered something in his ear about, you know, you don't do the dishes every night. But, you know, they laughed, and, you know, he was being teased by his wife. So I talked to all the women as well. So what I'm arguing, men, is that when you have children, if you do, and if you don't, that's great. We have too many children in the world, but many of us do end up having uh, kids, is that you should spend more time with the children than typical fathers did in the past, in the last generation or two. And that it's a mother and father together raising a child. Now, the woman is pregnant, gives birth, and about 80% of women breastfeed. It's good for the woman, it's good for the baby. So some women can't, but most do. Those are things only mom can do. But anything else is not gendered. You know, like doing the dishes, cooking food, going for shopping, stuff like that, playing with the kids is not gendered. It's something that dad can do as easily as mom, and it makes mom's life easier, and it's great for the kids. And it's good for dad because he's engaged. Now, what we see is, and what we're pushing for here, and I'm writing some stuff with McKinsey and doing some other things and some articles that are encouraging companies to give greater paternal and maternal leave, and senior men and women to encourage young men and women to take the time off. So this is something to think about. Now, an interesting flip it on this is that increasingly wives are making more than their husbands. Now, this may not work out for you, but for your parents or your grandparents' generation, typically the man made more than the woman. Where today, because of women's great education and, you know, talking to students here at Harvard, the woman may make more money than the man, which may mean that he calms down a bit for the family income to be the best, and he spends a bit more time with the family, which is what mom did in a generation or two ago. But it's something for you to think about that this may be something quite different for your generation, that 
the woman way may well make more money than the man and it's something you think and prepare yourself for and what are you going to do if that's true what's now my wife is a grade five elementary teacher so and we were in our 30s we had kids so she stayed home for a few years with the kids because why would you ignore your own kids to be with someone else's and it pays all right but not as well as myself so i could make more money and so there was a certain economic logic to that but again we can see that it may well be the woman who's making more money so something to think about as you go through life now another interesting thing is you start saving for university the day your child's born and you have programs you sit money away what you may well do early in your child's life is go to the grandparents and you know some you know often there's four one or two may have died but you might have more than four because of in-laws or um, uh, step parents and so on but that's fine it's their grandkid if they're happy to support so what you might go to your parents and your spouse's partners uh, parents and go can you save $200 a month towards Susan's university education and then you and your spouse will take over after a couple of years but it means that they already have some thousands of dollars put away and the grandparents may say that's all right we'll keep doing it so that you know that when the kid in 20 years applies to Harvard you can afford to help them so it's something to think about getting the grandparents right away and giving money towards um, the grandkids education university education now one of the things which is interesting is this idea two ideas i want to finish with one is managing upwards so i'll go back to some of my slides here and let me just bring them up and display them again one of the things you have to do is manage upward so one of the things we talk about is we don't say manage downward because that would be rude, but manage people work for you. And I suspect as Harvard economic uh, undergrads that you'll end up managing people as part of your career fairly rapidly. Now, managing up, and this is a great quiz uh, quote from Liz uh, Simpson of the Harvard Business School from uh, some years ago. The goal of managing up is not to curry favor, it's becoming more effective. So part of it, in my long career, I've always had a boss. I've always had to manage upward. Now I've had people work for me and I have about eight uh, students working for me part time, but it's the ability to manage upward is important for your career and will lead you to greater success. So it's something where we have to, we have to manage upward if you do it well, you'll have a better career and make more money. You'll have a better career for sure. Now, one of the things that people say to me is say, wait a minute, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur, I won't have a boss. And I asked some entrepreneurs about that idea that you don't have a boss. And Dax De Silva is a billionaire that runs a big uh, high-tech company here, thousands of people in Montreal. And I asked him and he said, everybody has a boss. From my experience, when you're VC backed, your key investors can feel like your boss. And when you're a public company CEO, which he is now, the same is true of the chair of the board and your board. In both cases, if you retain enough in ownership and influence, you can retain the final say on key decisions. And I asked a guy named Helgi Selsi, uh, Seltzen, who uh, does an incubator here in Montreal, but was a uh, very successful uh, entrepreneur twice. And it says boss has two connotations, someone who tells you what to do and someone who can hold you accountable. And he says, as an entrepreneur, you have people that tell you what to do, your investors, people like that. So that's important to realize that everyone has a boss. All right. So let me see if there's any, I'm just checking the chat here. Um, okay. So. When you think about it, one of the key things you have to think about when you're looking at managing your boss is simply what is their agenda? And so one of the things you have to understand is when you think of a pyramid, a typical organization, the CEO sets the agenda, the strategy for the whole organization, and then the C-suite, COO, CFO, CMO, and so on, do it for their functional areas. So if you're the CMO, you set it for marketing and sales, customer service. Now you and I are tend to be down here where our 
boss has objectives to reach to help their boss to help the CMO to help the CEO reach the overall corporate objective. So it's like a rowing team. And you've probably seen these in the Charles River. Uh, I remember I rowed a bit at Oxford, didn't at Harvard. I wasn't good enough for Harvard for the hockey team or for the rowing team, you know, but at Oxford, it was a, a bit more of a, a gentleman's thing, if you would. Um, and again, hockey was uh, more Canadians and Americans who play it as opposed to Brits. And why they have, you can see there's a woman in the back of the, of the uh, boat here. They typically have a small woman or man with a big voice and their job is to yell stroke, stroke. And what they're doing is getting the team to row together because if you didn't have that person yelling stroke, the cox, you'd row off in different directions. It's the same way in an organization. What you have is we're all rowing together. So one of the things you want to ask your boss is, what are you trying to accomplish? What are your top 10 things this year? What are your priorities? And, and again, and Simon Sinek, the idea of why is really important. As Zs, you want to understand why this is going on, what's going on, what's happening here. Why are these things important? And if you understand why they're important, you can then do a better job. And you can also say, well, I'm not sure about that explanation and help them rethink a little bit. What I want to do as a, an employee is I want to help my manager in one of the top three or four things on her agenda. Because if I'm looking after number 17, who cares? We have to do 17 if we have time and, you know, and so on. But I want to be involved in the top three or four things that my boss is working on. Because if I help them reach that, I'll be a star, someone they want to promote, someone they want to take forward. So think about what are thy priorities? So even in a summer job, say to the boss, what is it that you're trying to accomplish this year? And how does my job help in one of those things? So don't wait to tell them for them to tell you, you ask them and you go forward and know what's going on because it's really important to understand what is their agenda and manage upward appropriately from a career viewpoint. Because if I'm helping my boss reach their objectives, they're more apt to promote me and see me as a corporate star that's valuable. Then as you get up each part of the ladder as you go up, you'll be seen as valuable, that a team player that delivers the results of things we're looking for. Okay, so one last idea I wanna do is a book that I'm doing um, it's called, uh, We're All Ambiverts Now. So this is a book I'm doing for the Stanford University Press, and I'm down teaching on the Stanford MBA uh, next month, as a matter of fact, I go down every year. Well, I've been going by Zoom the last couple of years, but uh, actually gonna be uh, on Stanford's campus, so it's great to be down there. And what I looked at, I read a book called Quiet by Susan Cain about seven or eight years ago, wrote a Forbes blog for it, and I blog weekly for Forbes, and it got, 60,000 plus views. And it was about introvert leaders. And our traditional view of leaders is they're all extroverts. It's kind of the traditional dated view. And what I've written quite a bit about is um, how great introverts are as leaders. And that's, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the idea from that book. But it's important things for you to think about and consider in terms of your career as you go forward. So I don't know if you know, um, what introversion and extroversions. If you can't see my screen, let me know. It says you can, so I'll believe it and, and go forward in faith on that. But go ahead and interrupt Edward or someone if, uh, if it's not working. So it's not about being shy. The central construct around introversion and extroversion is stimulation. So what we see is that it's how we respond to stimulation is the central idea, the central thing. So Introverts love people, love being with people, but after a certain amount of stimulation, they go, enough of that, I need to take an introvert break and recharge. So what they do is they go walk a dog, or they listen to music, uh, they go outside and they just get away from other people and away from the stimulation that comes from that. So those are introverts. Now extroverts, and I'm an extrovert, I'm, uh, it, it's a bell curve. And so I'm an extreme extrovert. Most people are a bit extroverted or a bit introverted. Some people are more into, uh, extreme, myself an extreme extrovert. So extroverts seek stimulation because it lights up our brains. 
it gives us dopamine, dopamine hits. So we actually seek it out because it rewards our systems that we like it, it rewards us, we feel good about it. So it's interesting because I read about introvert breaks and no one had written about extrovert breaks. And I go, that's not fair. How come they get breaks and we don't? And I reflected, I sit here in my office at McGill and I'm writing a book on introverts and extroverts by myself. And after a couple of hours, I can't take it anymore. Do you hear the pain in my voice? I just can't take it anymore. And so what I do is I step away from my office, go downstairs, one floor where there's an endless supply of undergrads. Admittedly, I'm teaching and giving grades to, but they're happy to talk to me. In fact, some have heard this lecture, so they'll tease me, extrovert break. But I go to recharge my battery by being with people. Now, when I travel with uh, my wife and kids, I was in New York uh, uh, last year, and um, if I'm going to be in a restaurant by myself, rather than sit and read a book at a table that an introvert would do, I go to the bar and talk to total strangers. Now, it's something where I just talk to total strangers to get stimulation. And before I sit down, I come up and I go, uh, hi, I'm Carl from Montreal. So I'm in New York and so always a foreigner. Um, now I'm older, but I have a wedding band on. The first thing I say is, uh, and sadly, my wife and kids couldn't make it. So I'm stuck here by myself and thought I'd talk to some native New Yorkers. So everybody relax because, you know, I have a wedding band on. I mentioned my wife and kids. And it's kind of like, he's not trying to head on anybody. He's just here talking and have a conversation, which I find stimulating. So it's something which gives me energy, makes me feel positive. So I wrote an article for Wharton Leadership Digest about five type of extrovert breaks. So the central construct is, and it's a bell curve, is that introverts tend to like people, but at a certain point they have too much stimulation to take introvert breaks, or extroverts love being with people. And during the pandemic, I wrote an article from my Forbes blog 10 days in going, I can't take it anymore. This was 10 days in. So you can imagine a year or two years later, like uh, for an extrovert. So I would come down to McGill uh, in the midst of the pandemic. I got permission. There was like five people in the building uh, at the building I teach in. But my uh, son was doing a master's at McGill. Our daughter was doing a bachelor's at the University of Montreal. So they were studying at home. My giving a lecture just bugged them. It was too noisy. So I got permission to come down and there was almost no one here anyway. Uh, because I wanted to run into people on the street, masked, safe distance, but have a conversation. And there were some people downtown, so I would get some stimulation from being with people like that. Now, let's get back a couple more slides here in this introversion and extroversion thing. Um, so, now it's interesting, there was a study at Harvard uh, some years ago where they looked at four-month-old babies, so babies that don't talk, and mom or dad would bring them in and in the lab they'd provide some kind of stimulation and they'd see the response of the baby so you know when i meet a newborn you know young babies you know mom or dad brings them in uh, the one of our mba students some babies will turn towards me and go what and they find it stimulating many babies will put their head on their mother or dad's chest because it's too much i'm noisy i'm big it's dad on steroids sort of thing so they looked at four month old babies and followed them for decades and it was about a 40 to 50% predictor how they acted at four months and as in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, if they're more introverted or extroverted. So the simple thought here, it's partly it's, it's our hard wiring. So we don't have to feel guilty about it. It's the way we were made. So it's all right. So I'm an extrovert, but to some degree, that's the way God made me. So I can just relax, but I have to be an adult and act like an ambivert. Okay. So I have a test here, but I'll skip over that in the interest of time. Um, so I have automatic lighting, and if I don't move around enough, the lighting uh, goes off. So I guess I lack charisma or something. So when we look at it, a couple things here on introverts and extroverts and how they're different. Part of this is saying, knowing what you are, you can do a better job of knowing how to be a successful business person or whatever you end up doing and what I'm arguing is, well, yeah, we all have to be ambiverts now. So an ambivert is someone in the middle that acts like an introvert at times and an extrovert at other times. Now, I've interviewed about 450, 500 executives, and probably about 40% of executives are genuine introverts, 40% are genuine extroverts, probably about only 20% are ambiverts. 
but the title of the book is We're All Ambiverts Now, arguing that as an adult, you've got to act like the other on occasion be an effective leader. So I'll get to that in a thought in a second. So introverts like to focus on one thing at a time. They like to get their ducks in a row. They like to connect the dots. Extroverts like multitasking because it's stimulating. It gives them energy. It gives them dopamine hits. Introverts tend to be more reserved, extroverts enthusiastic. Introverts prefer to listen and think things through where extroverts like the stimulation and the spotlight. Now the danger of this is they can make things up as they go along. The danger for an introvert is paralysis by analysis, that they don't ever get to a decision because they're thinking about it forever. And I gave a talk at the Harvard Business School uh, just before the pandemic and to about 300, 250, 300 people at the Harvard Business School about this topic. And it was interesting that one of the HR women said about 60% of the Harvard MBAs were introverts. But the case method at the business school is every class is a case and the professor comes in and calls on someone and they open up and spend 10 15 minutes solving the case and the rest of the class is the other students showing how wrong and what they should have done differently where the introvert tends to hold back too much so that's something that they wanted me to encourage the introverts to speak up more um, introverts tend to be cautious decision makers extroverts because the stimulation just kind of go for it Get, that can get you into trouble. We've talked about recharging. And again, conflict, something extroverts don't mind because it's stimulating. Okay, so we have the ambiverts in the middle. So one is we looked at stimulation. Introverts prefer calm and less stimulation. Extroverts like it. Extroverts prefer action. Introverts prefer deliberation when it comes to decision making. So ambiverts are people are in, in the middle. And what I'm arguing is that we all have to act be like ambiverts. But again, it's about 20% of people. But as an extreme extrovert, to be an effective leader, effective business person, I need to act like an introvert at times and listen better. And just shut up. Just listen. Where on the other hand, the introvert sometimes, as they get more into a leadership role, have got to give an inspiring speech. They've got to step up and they've got to work the crowd. So I was in an event lunch today, about 300 people there, and you've got to work the crowd a bit to be effective as a, as a young person or as you get more senior leadership roles in those roles as well. So you've got to act like an ambivert at times to be effective. Now, just one or two more slides I'll be done here, is that I interviewed some um, famous people, one of them, Justin Trudeau, who would appear to be the world's biggest extrovert, but... I've known him. He graduated from McGill just before he got here, and I guess did some things with him. If I was known he was going to be prime minister, I would have been friendlier. But on the other hand, his father had been prime minister, I should have guessed. But say Levy, one of those things. And I, I, I asked him if he's an introvert or extrovert on my radio show, and uh, he said he's an introvert. I rolled my eyes. I know him uh, for years, and I'm an older man, so I could tease him a bit. And he said, I think I'm an introvert who's learned to be an extrovert. I'm so perfectly happy to sit in the corner, read a good, uh, good book, be on my own, go for a walk in the woods, a long hike. It really deeply satisfies me. These are traditional introvert breaks versus the fact that my job, he's prime minister, is being much more people person. I like people. I like exchanging, but that's when I'm on. I'm doing the work I need to do. If given the choice, I like a small group of friends around me that I can kick back and relax with. He knew when he was becoming prime minister, he had grown up in the prime minister's house similar to the White House in the US, his dad was prime minister for 10 years or so. He knew what he was getting into. I asked Mohammed Yunus, who uh, is one of the world's big introverts, but I've seen him give speeches in Montreal and work the crowd. And what he said is, I said, Mohammed, I guess you're an introvert. Yes. He said, yes, I act like an extrovert because I'm helping millions of the poorest women and children on earth. How could I not act like an extrovert? So it's something where you go, this is simply being a good person. And he did the right thing. One last thought is that there's a cultural overlay to this introvert extrovert thing that I'll just show you a quick diagram here. So I should have done this. And this is kind of looking at data that suggests that the darker green is more extroverted, lighter green is more introverted. And, and it says that there's a cultural overlay. So we have to act a bit differently in the culture than we might in another culture. I teach in Iceland, my mother's Finnish. So I'll tell you one, my, my one introvert joke. How do you tell an introvert, a uh, Finnish introvert from a Finnish extrovert? 
A finished introvert looks at his shoes when she's talk he's talking to you. A finished extrovert looks at your shoes when he's talking to you. And again, you can use this about engineers and all sorts of things. But um, but even in the U.S., I lived in L.A. for six years, six years and lived in Boston for a while and been in New York often. In L.A., I tend to be more introverted, a bit quieter, a little more laid back. Where in New York, you turn up the volume as it's New York. And you gotta you got to do that to be effective and successful. So... Went through a bunch of points there. Some had some financial uh, implications, others more just about thinking about your career and thinking about the decades that you're in. So the 20s is a time to get your master's out of the way, most likely, even if you have a Harvard undergrad. And again, I would I would encourage you to think about Oxford or Cambridge, one of the great European schools that uh, Americans have heard of. If you come back to the States, no one in the world has not heard of Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge. And you already have a Harvard degree, or you will shortly, hopefully. Um, getting an Oxford or Cambridge degree or Stanford degree just adds to your network, adds to the brands that you have associated with you that are really great things to think about. So those are some of the things you think about. Um, so I have a question here. Um, sorry, I'll get to the question about women uh, from an anonymous attendee. As as women making more money, I feel the traditional role of women remain in addition to responsibility work is added. Do you see this trend that women are getting more and more of the burden of work plus raising children and house chores? Absolutely. Oh, uh, Ed, go ahead if you want to answer that. Oh, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. I was going to say you were answering it live. Oh, sorry, no. So it's interesting that I did this work on p paternal leave, so fathers going on leave with newborns, interviewed 70 men and 70 women you know, the mothers of the of the, uh, the babies involved. There is an evolution going on there, and I think your generation will more buy into this, um, that what we're encouraging men is to be more involved in raising the children because it's a gender equity thing, but it's also, it's good for dad, it's good for the kids, and it's good for the relationship with mom. And what you try to do is stay together as a couple for the kids, and for yourselves, now it doesn't always work out, but if the man is helping the woman a lot, looking after it, and it's a shared responsibility, shopping, dishes, uh, cooking, changing diapers, it's more apt to get to a happier household in today's world. Again, for your parents or grandparents, different world to some degree. So I, 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 I think you're right to be a bit cynical about that, but we see it happening to some degree and we're trying to encourage it in society but we see it happening to some degree but it's going to take a while so another question um parnaz do you want to ask that on video i don't know if you're allowed to edward can she ask or he ask on uh, video i'm sure if you'd like to i'm just oh they cannot right now because they're okay not so I, I, i'll go uh, i'll just read it aloud. Thanks, Prof. Moore. With bank rates being so low and inflation on the rise, uh, what is your recommendation for saving for kids? Index funds versus mutual funds versus saving account. I think with kids, you can take on more risk because they're so young. And even at your age, you can take a lot more risk than your parents because your parents, if they're in their 50s, they're starting to think about retirement. And in your 60s, you kind of, you move, the thought is that of your 100% of your investments, in your 60s, 60% should be in conservative, careful investments, so you're not gonna lose it. But in your 20s and 30s, if you lose some money by taking on more risk, you can make it back. And so you're not as worried about it as you are in your 50s or 60s. So we tend to encourage more risky things. And for small kids that are like, you know, one year old, like they've got years, 20 years or so till they're uh, doing their university degree, their college degree. So you can take on more risk. So the younger they are, you more take on more risk um, than later on in your life is typically what we recommend. So any other yeah. questions? Yeah, so Comments? I just wanted to quickly um, say, uh, we'll not open up for a student question. Thank you, Professor Mar, for that informative presentation. Um, we've already started a little bit, but feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question out loud. Type in the chat. You can also mention me privately if you want to ask it anonymously. Um, so, okay, I have one right here. Um, I'm interested in your book about millennials and Gen Z. Could you perhaps talk about why you've decided to pursue this topic? 
Well, it's something where what I'm arguing in the book in one sense is this, is people over 45 with the university degree were taught a modern worldview. People under 35 with the university degree have been taught a postmodern worldview. So what you guys have been taught is postmodern worldview. And, you know, I've taught this in Saudi Arabia, Myanmar, uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai, Qatar. So I've taught it in countries that are less apt to be postmodern than the U.S. You know, where every university in the U.S. and Canada, and in fact, every university in the world that I've been to and talked to are postmodern in their worldview. So what postmodern thought of things like hierarchy? Who has truth? How much truth is there? What is truth? These are some of the things that postmodern thought comments on. And there's, a, you know, some debate about it in some, you know, woke society and those sorts of things. Um, by and large, I find that postmodern thought is rightish. And it's the worldview you have. Now, older people that manage you, the Xers and the boomers particularly, were brought up with a different worldview and they're still stuck in it at times. So what I'm doing the, in the book is trying to explain you all to older people and say, one, they're all good. Like, this is a reasonable worldview. So one of the points I make is that when I was young, there was this much truth. There's less truth than there used to be. I still believe there's truth. That if a woman doesn't want to have sex, it's rape and it's wrong in any context, including war. So some things I think the world says, yeah, that's wrong. That, you know, you shouldn't do that ever. And there's something where racism, you know, we would agree in our better moments that you shouldn't be racist. Like race shouldn't matter. And we might actually make up for, uh, in Canada, our original sin is indigenous people and the way we treated them. A bit in the U.S., but it's more of a Canadian problem. We found in Canada hundreds of babies in what's called residential schools and, you know, from a long time ago. And it's something where the colonizers really mistreated indigenous people. And indigenous people were generous to us at times, to the to the whites when they came because Thanksgiving, part of Thanksgiving is the indigenous people helped Americans down the States or Canadians, uh, colonizers, give them food and help them survive the first couple of winters. So it's something where there's a making up for some of those past mistakes for sure is part of why I do a column for the Globe Mail is, you know, for centuries, white men like me were lecturing indigenous people how to live. So we're turning the tables and go, it's high time that indigenous people teach us about life and have things to tell us about leadership. So there, there's that changing there that truth is a bit different than it has been in the past. Older people may feel uncomfortable to argue with that, but I'm trying to convince them that you guys are largely right. Ironically, there is some truth in what you're saying, ironically. Thank you. We have another question here, which is kind of, I guess, same topic, but do you have any tips um, for millennials and Gen Z when they're working with people of other generations, so for example, boomers? Well, you know, well, this is self-serving, but read my book, but you know, that's self-serving. But the idea is that um, you've got it partly as saying, look at, try to understand their world by talking to them about it, reading books about it, and get a sense of how they view the world. And you, this is kind of a good way of being mentored by them and discussing things like hierarchy and where do ideas come from and how do we get innovation here to a company. Like one view of strategy, which Michael Porter at Harvard talks about, is kind of CEO-led top-down, where my colleague Minsberg talks about how it kind of comes from the bottom up. And they're both used by organizations that you guys live as young people, as boundary spanners in a very turbulent world. So a boundary spanner is one foot in the real world and one foot in the organization, where people at the top tend to be isolated from truth and reality, where you guys on the front lines are more apt to know when things change, things are different. And the pandemic taught us this, that the frontline people, the ones who knew what was going on and where we're going, and this is very valuable and it's gotta be brought into the strategy process. So there's something where I think having conversations with your managers, managers, both reverse mentoring them, but being mentored by them will help you understand who they are, where they're coming from. And reading a bit of history can be helpful as well. So that you get where they're coming from and their worldview, and you can adjust yourself to it. But what I would argue, what I'm arguing is it's incumbent on older people 
boomers, Xers, and older millennial to understand you guys. And the advantage we have is we've been around your whole life, by definition. So I can get more what Edward's thinking because I know the world he grew up in. He can't get the world I grew up in because he simply wasn't around. We have one more question in the Q&A here. We might wrap up with this one. Do you think that tools such as MBTI, Meyer Briggs, um, Myers Briggs, a good tool to assess the extent of extroversion or introversion of your team so you can better manage them? Also, as an extrovert, what is the value or necessity of becoming more um, more of an ambivert aside from being able to finish a task that requires focus? Well, it's interesting that um, McKinsey, the great consulting firm, doing some work with them, and talking to them, they often do a Myers Briggs test. And part of what you do when you first get a team together and you work on teams quite a bit is say, which are you? And so it's something where I talked to the director of research at Myers-Briggs this morning in, in uh, Oxford in the UK by just happenstance. And we're looking at some of their data. I prefer the big five, but Myers-Briggs is used a lot. And the part I like is the introversion, extroversion part. So it's something that you have conversations. You go, oh, she's an introvert. She needs some quiet time to think, so I'll leave her alone. On the other hand, this other person is an extrovert, so she needs some time when she has dinner and is recharged. And after a day of analysis, she really does need that. So I'll lean into giving them what they need. And again, part of it as, a, as an extrovert, I want to act like an introvert. That is, at times, that's being an ambivert as an extrovert acting like an introvert, is to be a better listener is one of the central things. One of the most important skills of a leader today is to listen and get their input from their people. So that's one thing. Another one is not being the dominant person, always having to be the life of the party, always having to be the person that's looking after things. Ironically, as a professor, this is what I do. I give a lecture, I'm dominant. You ask questions, I answer it. And it's, you know, so maybe this is why it's good to be, for me, be a professor, ironically. But it's something where in the real world, you've got to listen to people and learn from them. One is that older people have things to teach you, but also other people your age or younger know the real world of as is it today. So there's real value to listening and learning from them and not biting your tongue because you have some clever thing to say. And again, you know, you're know, you Harvard students, so you have clever things to say. And part of the pleasure of being a Harvard or Oxford student is that you go to dinner and you're just very, really clever and you impress the guys or the girls how clever you are. And you know, part of the point is to be real clever. And that's fine, Edward, You're, you are clever, and we hope men or women like it, and that's good. But at a certain point, as a leader, it's not about how clever you are, it's about what you get them to help you accomplish. And the focus has got to shift away from you to them as a leader. Now, it's interesting, as a parent, around grade three, you lose your name. You're no longer Edward, but you're Susan's father, because it's her grade three class, and she's the center. And if you get upset about that, the rest of the parents go, Edward, grow up, your daughter, is more important. I mean, you're taller, you make more money, you have more education, you can beat her to any sport, but in that context, she's more important than you are, and everyone goes, totally agree that my child is more important in that context. Or if you go to your spouse's work, she or he's going to be more important in that context, so you got to back off a bit. So part of this is just being an adult. All right, thank you very much, Professor Moore. Um, we are coming on the end of our time today, so uh, we'd like to thank everyone um, for coming out today to the speaker event. We hope that it was as informative um, for you as it was for us. And of course, um, again, we'd like to thank Professor Moore um, for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks for the um, kind invitation. Very much appreciate it. Look forward so to doing it in person one of these days and being back to Harvard and be one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Absolutely. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.